This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3.0 optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to Corning.com slash Twit to save up to $130 on their superior Thunderbolt optical cables. Today on Grow How, you'll know how to water your plants. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 30 to 60 minutes, we're going to be showing you some of the projects that we've been geeking out to so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Brian! Padre. It's another Grow How. It's another Grow How, and, uh, you know, I, I'm excited about these projects we've been doing it's because... they fun. They're different. It's taught me that... I have a tendency to kill plants. Yes, yes. But even through my best efforts, they have lived. Like we have these. You know, you have to try to kill plants. <laughs> and I, in the past, I have really tried. See, the, the point for me is that I have tried and I have not tried. I have never fi found the, the proper the middle ground of keeping a plant alive. Well, that's why we, we really started the whole Green Geek, the Grow How series on Know How. And that is because technology has gotten to the point where we can take a lot of the guesswork yeah. out of the growing experience. It really used to be sort of this artisanal type thing where mm -hmm. you had knowledge that was passed down from generation to generation to generation, and that's still right. there. That's still very important. But now we have things like really inexpensive meters and ways to feed our plants with, with very precisely measured doses, dosages of nutrients mm -hmm. so that we're not just kind of throwing things just in there and hoping it just Just winging out. it? Just wing. And I, I think you were mentioning it earlier today that you have a tent where everything is a autonomized, and yeah. then the one that you've been caressing and, and, and like caring for everything, can doing everything yeah. for your plants, really putting the love into them, and the ones that are automated are doing better. Yes, I, I, what we found out, or actually what I found out really quickly, is plants love a regular schedule. So you know, I may give love, care, and attention to each and every single plant each and every <laughs> single day. But my watering schedule and my feeding schedule will be off by a couple of hours because it depends on what I'm doing during the week. Yeah, when you get home. Correct. Whereas in our automated tent, it's everything's controlled. It always gets, every 12 hours, it gets its dosage of water and its dosage of nutrients. It's got the right amount of light. All of the lights are automated. I don't do any interaction with that tent other than coming in every once in a while to prune. Right. And it's doing so <laughs> much. So, I'll show you yeah. a picture of it uh, at some point. but. The, uh, the the loving tent, yeah. it, they, they're okay. They, you know, they're like this much off the ground. Yeah. The automated tent is like that. And it's the same plants, and they were planted mm. at the same time. So, That's funny. You know, kind of deflates the ego a little uh, bit. Maybe you're killing them with your love. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, that actually happens. I mean, that, that's uh, something that was happening with this. Remember, last week we, we actually did this early because the plants had gotten to the point where they were hitting the lights. They're actually they're the getting burned. burned. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it soaked up all the water. So. Remember, the first two weeks, we still had plenty of water in here at the end of the two weeks. We just purged it because we wanted to get rid of all that brackish nutrient mm -hmm. stuff, right? The gross stuff. This was empty. Yeah. It, so in a week, it sucked up more water, way more water than it did the previous two weeks before. And that's pretty much how the cycle of growth is going to be. Yeah. In the germination slash seedling stage, it's really just getting a, a toehold. The roots are going into the, into the ground. And then it accelerates. It accelerates. Yeah. It explodes. It hits what's called the vegetative cycle. And if I you, have a vegetative cycle. I am a vegetative <laughs> cycle. Yeah. But uh, if you give it enough light, if you give it enough water, if you give it enough nutrients, it will just grow, grow, and grow. Nice. Yeah. yeah. No, this has been fun. Yeah. So today what we want to do is we want to talk about water. We haven't really talked about it. We've shown the use of water. But it's one of those things that we know plants can't do without. In fact, right. you have a bonsai tree that's been going without water for, what, how long? Uh, I want to say a week and a half. I go back that's and forth. Good. 
That's yeah, not good. I it doesn't like that. I thought I was giving it too much water at one point. And then you and said, then, okay, no more water for you. Well, then I was paranoid because the pH, I didn't, wasn't doing the pH yeah. level stuff. And, and so, yeah, it's not, it's hiding somewhere. I don't know where it went. Water but. is one of the strangest things that we take care of in the grow because light we kind of understand. Give it enough light, don't let the light get too close. Right. You know, we understand fertilizer now. Fertilizer is always oh, start off weak. If the instructions say give eight milliliters, we give four, and then we can increase it or decrease it from there. Mm -hmm. But water is something that we can't just say, no, you don't get anymore, because they'll die. <laughs> and also, if we put too much, they'll, drown they'll, them. they'll die, they'll drown. Yeah. You have to find that, that medium. Now, we've done our homework in the soil for our pea pod project, because right. we added a lot of perlite, which allows for drainage. Mm -hmm. So even if we overwater, in fact, that should make it impossible to overwater because the water will drain out faster than the roots can drown in it. Right. But we still need to pay attention to what we actually do with the water and wa where the water comes from because that has a big impact on uh, what our crops will end up doing. Right. Well, it's if you don't have the right pH, then you salt lock the nutrients. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk about two things at the start. pH, which we've talked about before, and TDS, total dissolved solids or total dissolved salts, depending on how you want to say it. Hmm. It's also known as EC, which is electroconductivity. These are the two ways we have of knowing what's going on with our water. And more than that, these are the two ways that we can find out what's going on inside the soil. We weren't able to do this before. Before, it was always sort of, well, I'll our best guess, and hopefully that doesn't kill the plant. <laughs> yeah, which some people seem to be better at than, than others. Yeah. And we're, we're in the category of not being good at it Precisely. at all. All right, so let's go ahead and kick it off. We've got standard tap water. This just came out of the tap about three or four minutes ago. Okay. Um, so this is Petaluma's finest. Mm. Mm, yummy, yum, yum. Now, the first thing we want to do anytime we have water is we have to measure pH. Now, right. uh, remember, you've, you've done this quite a, quite a few times. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you play with the TDS. This one's just real quick. So right now, out of the tap, you stir this around a little bit, this is running about eight. Mm -hmm. Eight, one, maybe all the way up to eight, two, when it settles, yeah. yeah. This is actually pretty typical for Bay Area water. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we tend to be a little heavy on the minerals. Um, not, not so great with that, you know, we don't, we don't like it at eight. Mm -hmm. Plants actually like slightly acidic. They love 5.5 .5 to about 6.8. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to drop that down and you already know what we're gonna use. Yeah, with the, well, where is it? The little dropper? Oh no. No, what? I don't got no little droppers for you now. Uh, this, that seems like a lot. This is a lot. This uh, definitely don't just pour it in because <laughs> that would be bad. Okay. Uh, there's two products that you, you absolutely should get. Uh, now, again, you can do this with home found like items. Like vinegar? Vinegar, you can use as pH down, and baking soda, you can use as pH up. So okay. remember, seven is pure water. That's neutral, no, yeah. no effect whatsoever. The, min the minute you start adding baking soda or pH up, it's going to go higher. Mm -hmm. And when you add an acid like vinegar or pH down, it's going to go lower. Right. The, the problem with using organics like vinegar is you actually get a residue. Um, oh, okay. And it's it's you can you can try this at home. Take a bucket, pour in a bunch of vinegar, get it down to like 6.8, and let it sit for a couple of days. Will it start you, to separate? Well, you'll get the slime that kind of forms Eee. on the bottom. You, and remember, that would actually be in the soil. You really yeah. don't want that. Okay. So this these are cheap. I think I bought both of these for something like eleven dollars. They kind of look like cough syrup or they, candy. Uh, you really shouldn't drink these. Yeah, maybe that would be. Dope. They look like candy. That's that's. Manky candy. Manky. Yeah, manky candy. All right, but you know, we've done it so many times, we're not going to balance this because we do want to focus on something else here, uh, and that is TDS, the total dissolved salts. We briefly touched on it with the, when we did the 101 episode, mm -hmm. but this is not about the acidity of the water, which we'll, we'll come back to because we need to talk about why that's important. This is about what's actually in the water. So, like salt? Salt, salt anything? heavy metals, basically. Anything you add into the water, it's going to change what's called the EC, the electroconductivity. Hmm. That will let me know how much stuff is in any given amount of water. Well, it's considering it just came out of the tap, there shouldn't be a lot of stuff in it. You, Should there? you think? Like, there you won't think? be lead in there, will it? Do you think, it? Brian? Do you think? Because I got, I got some tap water right here. This, yeah. this actually, I let settle a little bit because I, I didn't want to give an erroneous... Uh, reading. So yeah. this has actually been sitting for about five hours. Okay. So you can actually, there's a little bit of sediment at the bottom, which already, not really happy with that. That's not great. That couldn't have been in the bottle beforehand? No, no, that was a clean bottle. Oh. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn this on. And, um, well, actually, first, 
let me show you what pure water looks like, or near pure water. This, I ran through a re reverse osmosis filter. It's one of those, you know, pure or Brita. Mm -hmm. You just pour water in the top and then, right. yeah, it filters out. So it's, it's carbon, charcoal activated and so on and so forth. Okay, we should have done the water cooler though. We really I'd be kind of curious. <laughs> no. So this is a 39, oh, actually 21. And let's oh, stir around a little. It's pretty good. Yeah. Let's see what we get here. One, four. 40. Okay, that's not bad. So 40, 41 or so ppm, that's parts per million. Okay. So what that tells us is uh, in, in any ppm reading, mm -hmm. it's per liter how many particles that it finds. And the okay. way that it finds it is because if you, if you have pure water, it's actually um, zero. Because it doesn't conduct There's nothing in there, right. Yeah. There's, it's neutral. So there's, there's no positive or negative mm -hmm. uh, cations or anions that are just floating around, mm -hmm. which is what actually allows charge to go through water. So if you ever have pure, 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 pure water, it, it, it will not conduct electricity. Interesting. Right. The minute you start adding anything, be it salt or like magnesium or dirt, oil, that's whatever. That's like connecting the dots? For you, get, you get those loose uh, ions, either negatively or positively charged ions, and it starts allowing for the flow of electricity. Hmm. That's what this meter picks up on. So now that we know that uh, pure, like filtered water, is going to be 40 or so, yeah. uh, do you want to find out what we got out of the tap? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's All probably right. like 60. 60? All right, let's more. see. Let's see. Let's take a look here. I'm just spitballing. Um, oh, crap. <laughs> Wait, is that 320? Yeah, that is. From that's, uh, 40? That's, that's out of the tap. So oh. the same water that I ran through a Brita filter and got down to 40, so out of the tap, it's over 300. What's in there? Um, no, I mean, that's just, that's, that's salt. Yeah. That's chlorine. Is that typical? That's pretty, is that normal number that's, for that's tap water? That's actually kind of, well, for around here, our water tends to be a little bit hard, especially in Petaluma because there's a lot of groundwater. Mm -hmm. Anytime you pull well water or groundwater, your, your TDS is going to go this up. This doesn't necessarily mean it's bad for no, you, No, it's, right? it's not necessarily bad because it also depends on what kind of solids are dissolved in the water. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. Anytime I have solids dissolved into water, when I put it into the soil, it, those cations and anions are going to interact with atoms that are already in the soil. That makes sense. And if they combine, I can create salts and then they lock my nutrients out of my plant roots and that's a problem. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. Uh, 320 is actually not too bad. I, I don't start getting worried until I hit about 400, mm -hmm. but 300 is still, I'm, I'm not real happy with that. Okay. Um, there are mm -hmm. a couple of things that we can do to bring it down, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. And for now, let me do this so I can remember which one is which. Because you're not gonna re-osmosis your, <laughs> every time you wanna water your plants. Well, right? Let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit about that okay. uh, in just a bit. But first, let's go back to pH, because we started with pH. pH is the easiest thing to deal with because we're pouring it into the plant, mm -hmm. right? And so if we've got the right pH, it does better. But the question is, why does it do better? And actually, if you go to the, the graphic I have here, this is what pH does to the different nutrients and micronutrients that your plant will need. So your, your plant needs plenty of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc, and molybdenum. Whoa. Right, so those, those bits and pieces are absolutely essential for plant growth. But if you'll notice, so the way, what this chart is showing you is at what pH does it dissolve and then what pH does it not dissolve? So let's take nitrogen. Hmm. Nitrogen loves seven. It's happy with seven. It will dissolve just fine. It will still dissolve between about 4.5 and all the way up to 9.5, but as you can see, its, it's ability to dissolve into the water really reduces as it gets either uh, higher or lower than seven. Okay, right? yeah. Now, but the problem is that's not the only nutrient that's gonna be in your soil. So that's not the only nutrient that's gonna be transported by the water. You also have iron, and iron wants like five. Okay. Uh, which is why we always try to balance like 6.8, 6.5, because that's about, that's the sweet zone where everything is going to dissolve. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, now the problem is, I mean, think about this. What was our, our pH when we, uh, when we got our water? It was like eight, eight. point, yeah, yeah. Eight, eight point something. So, so at eight- That's medium alkaline. Copper, zinc, boron, manganese, iron, they're not gonna wanna dissolve. Even phosphorus, which is a primary nutrient, is gonna start not dissolving into the water. You end up with salts instead. Hmm. This is why pH is so important. If you don't have at least seven, if you don't have balanced water, you're gonna start locking out nutrients and you're gonna get funky, funky looks on your plant. That's, hmm. that's what's happening. Okay, yeah. all right, that makes sense. 
So yeah. what do we do to like get get that closer to that? Well, we use pH up and pH down, and we always uh, if if like for example in the automated system that I've created, I actually have a real time monitor it because it's always pumping fluid in and out, mm -hmm. and it actually has a little reservoir of pH up and pH down, and you so know, it'll automatically. Yeah, it's like little That's measures cool. at a time. Yeah. Um, I really screwed up at the beginning, oh. and it was doing way too much, so my pH would go like, 9-3, 9-3. Yeah, Were you getting like an oscillating effect yeah, where it had bad. to keep balancing That was just bad out? programming, oh. so that was, that was entirely <laughs> on me. Uh, but again, the reason why we started with soil, because there have been people in our, our know-it-alls who have said, well, why didn't you start with hydroponics? Because hydroponics seems so much easier. Yeah. Mm, not so much. Right. Uh, the, the soil buffers. So if I mess up and I pour 8.5 pH water into mm -hmm. soil, that soil is already slightly acidic and it will actually bring it down to like 6.87. Right. So that, that will help me out. In a hydroponic system, if I pour 8.5 water into my reservoir, it just kills the plants. They right, do Because the, the soil is the buffer zone. The soil yeah. is the buffer zone. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually leaching my roots, <laughs> which they don't like. They're no, not they're happy with that. Yeah. yeah. The, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why we've decided not to do hydroponic. Like, because this is a hydroponic this system. This is a hydroponic system, but it's self contained. It, right. it does its own thing. But you'll notice uh, this actually grew much better when we pH balanced the water. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And as this gets older and it starts do, doing more and more nutrient uptake, we're going to have to start purging the reservoir more often because mm -hmm. what you don't want is you don't want um, what we did here, which was it got so low that we just added more nutrient solution. It's going to keep doing that, and eventually you're going to get, like, sludge at yeah, the bottom. Yeah, the slime. Which is pure nutrient. Ooh. And then they burn. Yay. Oh. oh. Not great. Sorry, guys. Yeah, you, sorry you'll be all right. We'll take care of you. <laughs> okay. So Do that's our pH. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other tricks that we can do, and we're going to actually do this next week on Grow How, the pH meter and the TDS meter are a great way for you to find out what's going on inside the soil. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you water, get about 20% of runoff, and then you measure the runoff. And so that's what I need to do with my bonsai. That's what you need to do with your bonsai. That will tell you, uh, after that water comes out, what is more or less the pH of my soil and also my TDS. If, the t if you water your bonsai and the TDS is like, 1500 yeah it's salt locked i'm a little worried because i think uh bonsai protective services will come and take my sir? bonsai away sorry you have no. not been properly caring for this we, plant you, you cannot have this plant sir <laughs> all right now let's let's talk a little bit about tds and what we can do to get rid of those salts because okay. again with ph we're trying to avoid salt lock we're trying to avoid nutrient lock mm -hmm. so the last thing we want to do is use water that already has a bunch of dissolved salts and solids in it right makes sense okay Here's, here's the thing, though. Uh, I used a Brita filter at the beginning because my plants were little teeny and tiny. And I'm yeah. like, oh, man, I'm making way more water than I'm ever going to use. Yeah. The minute they got into vegetation state, couldn't do it anymore. Because they are just absorbing so much water. So much water. Because you have to remember, for a plant, water, it, it is a nutrient, but only very slightly. It doesn't. It, it strips some of the hydrogen mm -hmm. out of the water, which is why we get oxygen mm -hmm. out of photosynthesis, and it uses those to make complex carbohydrates. Right. But the vast majority of the water, its only purpose is to dissolve the nutrients and, and get those nutrients to the, transport. To the roots. It's basically the blood of the plant? It's the blood. Well, the, the, the chlorophyll, chlorophyll is the blood of the plant. It's, yeah. it's like the highway of, of the plant. It, it mm -hmm. transports all the nutrients. And then also... That is the primary way that a plant will cool itself off. Have you ever wondered how a plant survives even though it's 130 degrees outside? I have. Worried. They get all wilty, though. They usually. get wilty, but that's a defense mechanism. What's happening is it's pulling up as much water as it can, and then it evaporates from the stoma, the little openings in the leaves. What? And as it evaporates, it, will, it has a cooling effect. So plants can survive extreme temperatures, but they need a lot of water to damn do that. Damn, plants. You're interesting. Yeah, damn. That's cool. Damn, nature, you scary. Yeah, all right. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of different ways to get rid of the solids. Now, some of the solids, like the salt and all that stuff, that's really the only way you can get rid of that was with a reverse osmosis filter. Mm -hmm. um, I have a high-capacity reverse osmosis filter, but I didn't want to use it until we get to the hydroponics episodes because I didn't want them to have to buy a $500 piece of equipment. Yeah, that, that would be kind of crummy. Yeah, no bueno. So instead, this is supposed to be cheap, fun projects. Cheap, fun project. Cheap, yeah. fun project. So instead, what we did is uh, we tried to get rid of the thing that is the easiest to get out of the water, and that's the chlorine. Right? Can't you just do that by letting it evaporate? You can. You can just you can like fill up five gallon buckets, like Home Depot buckets, yeah. and just let them sit there for a week, 
and hopefully the, the chlorine will go away. And pr unfortunately, a lot of municipalities are not using chlorine anymore. They're using chloramine. Oh. And chloramine won't dissolve as readily. You could, hmm. you could like use a, a UVC light to, to break down the molecules, but it needs a little push to, to sort of get it out of the water. Okay, all right. So is there any benefit to using rainwater over like tap water? People, yeah, rainwater tends to be more clear. So like I have buckets, I have big barrels Set outside. Set the gutter or something? Oh, uh, I don't, Because mm. <laughs> that's what my mom would do, is when it started raining really hard, she'd put buckets underneath some of the gutters and collect rainwater. You can do that as long as you're willing to pour out the first couple of buckets. Why would you do that? Because, oh, because all, all the, the junk stuff on the on the roof and comes the down, yeah. and you don't want to feed that to your plants. That makes sense. Okay. okay. Uh, but no, I was thinking this. This might be a little easier. Whoa! Air pump? It is an air pump. Active aqua. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna bubble air through our water. This will this will help to get rid of a lot of those dissolved gases. The, is that the why fluorine, you, the chlorine. Is that why you do it in like a fish tank? You do bubbles in a fish well, tank? Well, no, you're oxygenating. You're ah. oxygenating. We, which there's there's a couple of different reasons why we, we want to bubble our water. Hmm. The, the first is that uh, when you bubble the water, well, you're going to promote the growth of healthy bacteria because healthy bacteria like oxygen. If you have no oxygen in your water, which means no oxygen in the soil, mm -hmm. you're going to promote the growth of anaerobic bacteria. That's the bacteria that grows in the absence of oxygen. And that's not good for plants? That's not good. Th oh. Those are the bacteria that will they cause pestilence. They'll oh. basically kill your roots. Oh. Also, if you create a, a layer of low oxygenated soil, you'll encourage nematodes, which are these little, little teeny tiny organisms. What? Yeah, I know. It's, it's not word, actually right? a toad? No, it's a nematode. It's, it's what different. What the heck's a nematode? Now, watch Red Planet, and that will totally tell you the wrong idea of what a nematode is. Okay, I already have the wrong idea of what a <laughs> nematode is. No, they're, they're little organisms, tiny microorganisms, uh, that they love soil with low oxygen. The problem is that tends to be at that top layer, so they will come up to the roots, and they'll destroy the roots. Oh, okay. So okay. don't do that. That's bad. Okay. Uh, we also like this because by oxygen oxygena oxygenating, by putting oxygen into the water, yes, we put it into the soil, and roots love oxygen. Okay. Because yeah. it uses that to help transfer nutrients and stuff like precisely, that. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. So we are we're bubbling for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the, some of the best benefits are going to come from the fact that oxygenate, oxygenated water is uh, going to be healthier for everything. But also, if we use something like a bubbler, we can force a lot of those dissolved gases, solids, out of the water, which will drop our TDS and make it better for us to, to, okay. to use for the water. So what we've got here is a pump. Let me go ahead and plug How this one in. How much is this little guy? The, actually, here, plug it on your side. Okay. Uh, this little guy was, uh, you have the link for this, right, Kara? Uh, there we go. So this was a hydro farm. This is a, a six watt. This is a 15 liter per minute active pump. It's got four outlets. Now, um, there are some really crap brands out there yeah. that will do something like this, but they don't have a regulator on the, uh, on the outlets. This is important because if you don't have a regulator and you leave one of these off, mm -hmm. the gas will want to escape through the one that's got the least pressure. So oh, so you won't actually be pushing you won't air through, through the, the other three, <laughs> right? You all go through one. So you, you know, uh, always trust a good brand, one that's got a decent regulator. This will push the same amount of air through all four outlets, no matter how much resistance there is. Okay. Okay. So really easily, you need this. You need some tubing. Woohoo! And then you need some air stones because the air stones are going to keep this See, thing at the bottom. That's exactly what I had for my fish tank. Yeah. No, this is this actually this is a fish tank air oh, stone. Cool. So all you do is you put this in, like so, and then you just drop it. Yay! And, and now we're bubbling. Now I I actually have all four of these. Uh, in use right now. So two of them go to the reservoir for the automated tank, mm -hmm. and two of them go to buckets that I have of, uh, of standard tap water. <laughs> so you just bu buckets of water That's all in, your, in your all place? Day. Just, just bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. Do and any of your uh, the other brothers walk by and say, like, what the Well, heck? they know what I'm doing in there, okay. and like they, they come in and they hear the buzzing, like, now nah, we don't want to come in. Yeah, <laughs> he's got bubbling water again. Well, they, they, they think it's, like, high voltage. I'm like, it's just water. It's okay. <laughs> not going to kill you. Guys, probably. don't you know water doesn't conduct electricity <laughs> that well if it's pure? No, but so what this is going to do over the course of, I typically leave them bubbling for three days before I use them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is absolutely going to force the chlorine and any fluorine out. 
that's just going to dissolve out. Okay. Um, and you'll end up with a TDS that was probably half of what you started with. So if okay. I started with 300, this will be a TDS of one, 120 to 150. Does this also lower the pH balance? It does because as the, well, it raises it. As oh, it the chlorine it. comes out and the chlorine's right. an acid, right. the it pH is going to rise. Okay. Right. Which is why I need to use pH down to bring it back down. Right. So okay. this is a super cheap way of doing it and, and every grow should have one of these. And of course you can dial it up or down depending on how much air you need. In the only thing. thing that's disappointing is I, I wish there was like a little um, submariner in there, you know, where the <laughs> treasure chest opens up and bubbles come out. I, I, we could, I guess we could do that. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of now seeing this, I want to do like a fish tank project. You know, like the, how not to kill your fish. Actually what I wanted to do when I was mm -hmm. building my new set, I wanted to put like vertical uh, tubes behind yeah. me filled with water and just have bubbles. Bubbles and then LED uh, lights yeah, behind right, it. Right. That would be pretty cool. But that's not really grow how. That's more That's just bling funsy, how. yeah. That's just Art for, project how. For giggles. Mm. For giggles. So this this is the setup that I use. Uh, and I actually, you're not going to want to hear this, but for some of the critical infrastructure for my grow room, yeah. I always have two. Two? Because, you know, like for example, I have two of those really expensive lights. And the reason is if right. it dies... I can't wait a week for the new light to come in. My plants will die in that week, or at least they'll get yeah. very, they'll be very, very unhappy. They get stressed out. So, like the lights, my power <laughs> supply, my air supply, I always have a spare. In fact, this is the spare unit okay. uh, for my grow room, um, and that's that's just kind of how you have to deal with it. Especially things like a carbon scrubber, because my automated tent does smell horribly. It smells really, really bad right now. <laughs> um, but so this is a, a system set up for hydroponics, but if you're just doing like basic gardening with soil, you don't you don't need to do this, do you? That's this this is basic gardening with soil. So you you're this is what I'm using. I'm but I've never seen I don't know my mom grows stuff without having to do that. I mean look plants are resilient, so you could water straight out straight out of the tap and it will probably grow just fine. But I mean if you want like this. Or like and not like pods. my bonsai. Not like your bonsai. Mm. You know, if, if you put a little bit of love and attention into what goes into the grow, <laughs> it, it does so much better. Okay, all right. It's okay. like uh, if you're baking a cake or something, you want all the purest ingredients. I get it. Yeah, and also my cake. Yeah. So, stay away. Can I, um, can I take this home then? Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> Just go ahead and bubble I, that up. Yeah. Now, when we come back, uh, there is always a question that we have from, from uh, um, people who are starting to grow, and that mm -hmm. is, what happens when I go on vacation? What happens when I go away? This is always a problem. Don't. Don't. Easy. Yeah. 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 You, you could either decide to never go on vacation, or you could take a look at what I played with in the next segment. But first, let's go ahead and thank the sponsor for this episode of Know How. Hey, Brian, you know what these are? Yes. These are the corning cables. Yeah. Now, like imagine, imagine all the speed of Thunderbolt, or USB 3, but with a range that is five, ten times greater than what you could get with those. Yeah, and they're, uh, you can step on them. You, you can, can step them on them. You, you can, can tie it them. in a knot. These are cording optical cables that give you the capability to extend your USB 3 or your Thunderbolt port. And I got to tell you, we swear by them. If you're looking for a high fidelity, high quality way to transmit data, transmit audio, transmit video, transmit whatever it might be, then there is no better product than Corning. Now, Corning's products have been religiously engineered for years and years and years. They know how this works. They were one of the originators of fiber optics, so they understand how the technology works. Now, take a look at this. This is a demonstration of their, of their cables. If you're dealing with copper, of course, you're going to be limited by the distance. If you're dealing with standard fiber, you have to worry about kinking it. You have to worry about stepping on it. You have to worry about putting too much of a bend in it. Not so with Corning's Thunderbolt and USB 3 cables. You see, these cables have been engineered a little bit differently. The, the cladding is stronger, the core is a bit more fine. You could step on it, you can fold it, you can tie it in knots and you'll still get all of the signal than you would if, uh, well, you were using a copper. Now these USB and Thunderbolt cables are incredibly strong and flexible with exceptional cable runs of up to 60 meters, that's 200 feet for us Americans, for Thunderbolt <laughs> devices and 50 meters or 165 feet for USB 3. This makes it easy to move those noisy peripherals away from the desktop. You can put it in a closet just connected by a very durable fiber. Now, these cables are hot swappable and you can daisy chain up to six Thunderbolt devices. That means you can bend or walk on Corning's ultra slim cables and even if they're tangled they'll keep transmitting at top speed. Try to do that with your uh, 
imitation competitor. Mm -hmm. Now, Universal Audio relies on optical cables by Corning. They are a professional studio, and they achieve acoustic isolation in that studio when they test their new equipment, such as their best-selling Thunderbolt audio interfaces. If a testing company, if a company that you depend on to give you quality equipment trusts Corning, don't you think you should too? Instead of investing in multiple extenders, adapters, and cables, turn to Corning to establish the connection that you need with one simple long length cable. Their products are available at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. Corning cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Just go to Corning.com twit to save up to $130 on Thunderbolt optical cables. This promotion is valid until August 31st or while supplies last, whichever occurs first. So don't waste time. Go to Corning.com slash twit. That's Corning.com slash twit to save on their unbeatable Thunderbolt cables. And we thank Corning for their support of know-how. Did you say this is not a good idea? Not? It's okay. I like the cable. Do though. what now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, let's go ahead and have a bit more fun. We need to show you a way that you can step away from your grow without worrying about killing everything in your grow room. Uh, luckily, I found a device that can do just that. So, you've got crops, and you've been a good farmer. You pH balance your water, properly schedule your feeding, keep your grow area clean and healthy. You even sing to your plants. And we're talking smooth jazz, not that hippity hop stuff that all the kids on my lawn blast at odd hours of the night. You've done it all. But you find yourself in need of travel, and your plants can't live through the trip. Sure, you could ask a friend to water, and if you're not going to be gone for too long, you could do a deep watering and hope your plants can last before you get back. But the last thing you want to do to crops that you spent so much of your time on is to stress them. Friends don't always treat your plants the way you would, and drowning your roots by leaving them in standing water isn't really an option. What you need is an automated irrigation system for an indoor grow. This is the Kleber 8053 Automatic Drip Watering System. It's a 6.6-gallon .6 container with a programmable timer that can water up to 20 plants for up to 40 days, and it does it for less than $100. Out of the box, the Kleber comes with 33 feet of PVC hose, 20 drippers, and 20 spikes. The construction of the unit is pretty simple. Most of the 8053 is a container for the water, while the bottom panel hides a solenoid valve and the electronics for controlling water flow. Setup is simple. Add a 9-volt battery to power the timer and solenoid, then find a way to mount the claver at least 2.5 feet above the ground and 1.65 feet above the tallest pot. There are two outlets on the unit, which will be connected in a ring with the PVC tubing and the drippers. Set out your plants as you want them arranged, then put a spike into the soil of each pot. You want the spikes to be as level as possible. Avoid going up or down with the tubing as much as possible, and if you must, put the lower pots towards the side of the ring away from the claver. If you don't take the time to do this, water may not make it to some of the drippers. Once you're satisfied with your spike setup, it's time to add the tubing and drippers. Start by connecting one end of the tubing to one of the outlets on the claver. Now run the tubing around the ring, securing the tubing into each of the spikes until you've reached the second outlet on the claver. Be sure to not leave so much slack that the tubing droops excessively. If it does, you've just created a section of tubing in which the water will pool, possibly obstructing your water flow. With the ring complete, it's time to start snipping. Cut the tubing before each of the spikes and add a dripper assembly. Make sure the dripper is positioned so that the water will drip into the soil while not touching or directly dropping water on a leaf. You want to promote growth of the plant, not mold. Repeat the process for all the plants in your ring. Once all your connections are snug, make sure the programming switch is set to off, then fill the claver with 6.6 .6 gallons of water. Now we need to bleed the system to remove the air from the tubing. Those bubbles will restrict the flow, making watering uneven and unpredictable. Flip the selector to 10 days, then disconnect the PVC from one of the drippers. Hold your finger over the dripper outlet and let the water flow from the disconnected PVC tubing. Wait until you get a steady stream of water from the PVC tube, then cover it with your finger and release the dripper outlet. Once again, wait until the flow is steady, then reconnect the PVC tubing to the dripper. Your system is now air purged and ready to deliver a constant measure of water. Speaking of measure, we need to say a few things about the programmed watering. The Kleber has four options for watering, 10, 20, 30, and 40 days. However, that number is entirely dependent on the number of drippers you have installed. If you select 10 days, the solenoid valve will open for 12 minutes twice a day, delivering two ounces of water each time per dripper you have installed. 
If you've installed 10 drippers, that comes out to 40 ounces a day, which means our 6.6-gallon reservoir will empty in 21 days. If you select 40 days, the valve will open for 3 minutes twice a day, delivering half an ounce of water per dripper each time. If you've installed 10 drippers, that's 10 ounces a day, which means our tank will be empty in 84 days. If you need more water for a larger plant, you can always install multiple drippers per pot. One last bit on your to-do list before you leave for your travels. Before you depart, switch the program selector to your desired watering schedule and look at each dripper, making sure that the water is flowing and that it's going into the soil. Also, it's probably not a bad idea to make sure that you have some sort of overflow protection. The last thing you want is to come home and find out that you've been watering your carpet for two weeks. In any case, if you need to be away from your crops for an extended period of time, at least now your plants will have a fighting chance. You know, one of the things I really like about the Claver is it's nice and clean. It's a gravity-fed mm -hmm. system, so all you have to do is give it height. You, have to, you don't have to worry about plumbing it. You don't have to worry about having a pump. Right. It just opens the, the valve. It lets it run for the given amount of time, and then it shuts the valve. It's a super simple mechanism, and I, I kind of trust super simple mechanisms. Uh, yeah, especially if it's something that you're trusting to do for weeks at a time, maybe, if right. you're away, like reducing the complexity, like having a pump in it or something like that that could fail, or if it loses electricity or you know something like yeah. that. Yeah. One thing I will say is I am not comfortable with running, because I use organic nutrients. I will not run that in the clavers. The claver is only for pure water, mm -hmm. maybe with a little bit of CalMag. That's calcium manganese added into it. Hmm. Because if you give it organic nutrients, they, they will clump up. And, and tend to, it clog the... It the, clogs. Yeah. Now, that's why you've got that ring. So even if one side clogs, the water can still get to the dripper from the other side. Mm -hmm. But it's not an ideal situation. Right. No, I could totally see uh, putting this in the backyard on like a shelf or something or like a table and then having it feed into like the garden plants and stuff right, like that. Right, right. Oh, remember, at the uh, the maximum setting, each one of those drippers will provide, is it four ounces a day? So mm -hmm. I have four in my big pot. So that's, that's providing basically a Coke can of water every day. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that's only because I used to water every third or fourth day. So you'd have to make up for that? like. Well, it just means that it's it's getting a more regular water schedule. Remember, the automated tent is growing so much better. Yeah. So, you know, people people say they like to let it dry out a little bit because it, it oxygenates, mm -hmm. but because I'm already bubbling the water, the water that's coming through the claver is full of oxygen. It's very right. oxygen rich. Right. And yeah. as long as you have enough of uh, perlite in it, it'll drain. It'll drain just fine. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, I don't drain all that much because now it's it's almost like the perfect amount of water. The soil hmm. is never like crazy wet, but it stays a little bit moist. Nice. So it's, yeah, it's using it up to 100% uh, efficiency almost. No, it's yeah. it's uh, over 9,000 actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So kind of like when I don't have to go to the bathroom for a couple of days, it's like my body's working at peak efficiency. Isn't that how it works? Yeah, that's... Um, that's, right? that's, that's probably that's what's it? happening. <laughs> Peak efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move into a little bit of feedback. We had some questions about the episode we did on lighting. Uh, let's go ahead and bring one in. Brian, what do we got? All right, this one comes from Matthew, and he asks, I live on a piece of land that is 110 plus in the summer and down into the low teens in the winter. So the idea of an indoor grow is really appealing. Unfortunately, electricity is expensive, and I don't like the idea of running light fixtures 24-7. What is the best way to do an indoor grow without destroying my utility bills? This is actually a very good question. I am so glad you brought it up. Thank you. Uh, who is that? Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew. Thank you very, very much. So uh, there's a couple of things that you need to to consider. The first is the easiest, and that is use sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, use as much sunlight as possible because it's cheap and it's free. And you basically all you need is a window or a skylight, something that allows sunlight through, mm -hmm. and you can utilize that, that little bit of, of light, correct? That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then what you do is you supplement. So you can get the best of both worlds. What we love about an indoor grow is that we can grow year long, we can grow anything we want, uh, we can control the temperature, we can control the humidity, we control how much light it gets. But we but don't want to overuse utilities precisely to, and push up the price. Yeah. So what some people have done is they'll use like fluorescent T12s, like uh, the 4x4. Four four. So that's four four-foot tubes, which will give you about 35,000 lumen, mm -hmm. which is not bad at all. That's, that's actually pretty dang good. Uh, but they'll have it on a photosensitive timer. So it knows how long the, it should get. For example, if it's in vegetation, I should be giving it 18 hours of light. It can't use any more than that, so 18 hours is all I should have. Mm -hmm. But it also has a, uh, a photodiode 
that can measure the amount of, of natural sunlight that's coming in. And it can, can, it can turn on one, two, three, or all four of those lights. Uh, okay, that's cool. And right. It helps supplement? It supplements. And yeah. the nice thing about that is uh, it, it, your light, your, your plant, thinks like it's getting the same amount of light all the time. It's not constantly going up and down. Right. It just means that whenever the sun starts to set or when it, you get cloud cover, it'll turn on a couple of bulbs, mm -hmm. and then it will automatically shut off so you get six hours of darkness, which is, nice. you know, it, you don't have to do six hours of darkness, but what happens is if you run the lights those six hours, you're just, just using, wasting you're electricity. Just wasting electricity. Yeah. They can't okay, use smart. more than 18 hours. Uh, this is what I would suggest. I think we have a link for this. This is a hydro farm. This is not the photosensitive one, uh, but this is a very easy way for you to put your lights on a timer. It's a seven day program timer. This allows me to uh, shut my lights off after 18 hours. Uh, and there is another thing to consider here, uh, and, and that is cooling and heating. People don't consider this enough mm -hmm. because, uh, for example, if, if I'm in a very hot place, um, I don't run my lights during the day because running the lights during the day means now I'm cooling heat. off the lights and the plants. I don't right. want to do that. So I will make it that the hottest time of the day, my lights are off. Okay. Um, and, and I'll switch that up. If, it's, if I'm living in a very cold place, I'll make sure my lights are running at night right. uh, to, to give me at least that little bit of extra heat. So, you know, always consider... Hmm. your light cycle and how you could maximize it to avoid either heating or cooling your, your grow area. Okay, and do you have, do you have a system that you've plugged in, like uh, where you've programmed it those hours now? Like, because it's going to have to change during it's, the seasons, It's right? just here. It's just there? It's just here. And then you'll just have to go back and change it when the next season comes? Like, well, no, because, fall. I mean, remember, in my tent, there is no season. That's true. Okay. It's just, it's just, and you don't have you don't have any windows. I don't on have any it. windows. Yeah. No, I, okay. I'm doing a pure grow tent, so I get no outside light. At some point, I would love to use outside light because right. I, I mean, power's not expensive where I'm at. I'm at. It's it's like what uh, twelve cents a kilowatt hour, maybe mm -hmm. so six cents a kilowatt hour. So it's it's actually pretty cheap. But uh, like where he's living, it sounds like he's probably living. My guess would be Nevada. Yeah. Uh, probably near Mojave. Yeah, power out there can be really expensive. I mean, you can you can be looking at forty five to, to fifty cents per kilowatt hour. Right. And if, if you're in a hot place like that too, yeah. where you have to cool your house uh, during the day, yeah, not a good idea to have a bunch a bunch of lights on, not creating more heat at all. Cool. Yeah. Uh, now we we have another question that we'll answer a little bit later about distance from light. But rather than doing that, you know what we need to do, Brian? What's that? Um, we need to check on our Peapod project. <gasps> the Peapod now, project. You will remember. You were a little doubting Thomas on this one. I was a little bit of a doubting Thomas. You didn't think it was going to grow all that well. Uh, you know, I just I didn't want to get my hopes up because there's been so many other times that <laughs> I've, I've been hurt so many times. I just I couldn't let it happen again. Yeah, pretty okay. much. So here's what we got. Remember our, our pea plant uh, project was two Home Depot buckets along with some bamboo plants. That's a week of growth. That's just a week of growth. Now, remember, you put your little zip tie right here. I don't know. I think it looks lower than it was before. Did somebody know. move it around? No, That's you weird. tried to move it. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so this was your mark, yeah. and this was my mark. And look at oh, that. Wow. It exactly it's hit my mark. It's almost perfect. That's wow. crazy. It's mm. almost as if someone had practiced this experiment before we did it. Right, to see if it would work. <laughs> okay, I, I, yeah. I have that on yeah. you, so I, yeah, I can't. I can't. Now, there are a couple of things here that we should, we should look at. Uh, all of these vines have done a really good job of attaching into the trellis. This is why we set this up. They're, like, look at that. That's yeah. My favorite part is that it probably can't see it on camera, but each vine kind of yeah. has wrapped around like a little hand, gra reaching out and grabbing onto the net. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you can't get it from the side view, but we'll we'll show uh, in a future episode. I'll take a close up. But they have these little vines that kind of wrap around any supports, and that's how they stay together. In fact, downstairs, you were telling me we have kind of a mess in progress. We have a mess in project progress because we had set this down underneath a light and then we had a box light next to that. And then next, underneath that uh, secondary light was the original pea pods that right. we had in the grid that we never took out never of the out. grid box. They were like, yeah, they're fine there. So they kind of, they grew up and then they, they wrapped around, wrapped each, around each, other. each other for support. And not only that, they were like leaning towards this plant that had the good light yeah. over it and yeah. like trying to reach over, like help us brothers. Well, it's, and that's actually another very good thing and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into advanced grow how topics. Mm -hmm. But we had a box light. I mean, it's a studio, one of these. So it was bright. It was bright. I mean, that thing is probably 10 to 15,000 lumen. And then we had that little crappy 18 or 12 watt LED that was probably 
100, 200 lumen. Yeah. And they were all going for that light. Yeah. And the reason for that is we talked about this last week. Because the box light is not in the spectrum that the plants want. Precisely. It's providing all of that green, which is why we get this nice white light. And that's why a light like this looks so pink because it's not providing that spectrum. But by not providing that spectrum, it means it can use all of its power for the spectrum that the plants actually use. So your grow light really should look like that. I mean, it's got that pinkish hue. It's not particularly great. And yeah, it's blinding both of us, so I'm gonna get it down here. Um, but yeah, yeah. If what I have in my grow tent is I do have a fluorescent fixture, mm -hmm. but that's only when I'm working on it. I'll right. shut off the other grow light. So it's still light, so it's still light period, but yeah now I can actually see the true color. Right, you can see what you're doing. That yeah. makes sense. Now, we need to do a little bit of maintenance on this because this is doing really well. I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> by the end of the month, it's going to be at the top of the trellis because the growth is actually going to accelerate. Is it time for more zip ties? Because uh, I don't, I think it'll be to here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get there. But first, okay. uh, when we put this in, there was a few things that I, I didn't like, but we just did it out of time. Yeah. Uh, we put the soil in almost completely dry. There right. was a tiny bit of moisture from a, a previous bit, a grow, but not a whole lot. No. The problem was, is if you go to the overhead shot here, Kara, uh, you can see it's like some of these areas have kind of caved in. Yeah, there's like divots and ravines. And that's because as we watered it, it kind of settled down. Uh, a lot of the, those air pockets kind of bubbled out, mm -hmm. and we ended up with this uneven surface. We don't want that. Yeah. The second thing that happened is you can, f you can see exactly where it was watered. In fact, yeah, we okay. only watered this last week, so it would have been much taller if this was... If we had actually yeah. taken care of it? If we had yeah. taken care of it rather than just shoving it in a hole. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to even out. We're going to add a little extra soil to even out the surface, and then we're going to put a layer of perlite. That's just those, those white rock things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will keep the, the watering from scouring the soil. It will okay. just kind of it'll move the perlite, but the soil underneath should stay. will stay level. Right. Cool. So if you want to go ahead and glove up a little bit. Is it bit. time to get dirty? It's time to get dirty, Brian. That's right. what we got to do. It's grow how. Going to move my laptop this time. There's no growth without dirty, dirty glory. <laughs> See, you know, this don't you like the part. fact that I'm actually providing you with safety stuff now? Yeah, no, I, I like this. It's not the whole, hey, Brian, here's some acid. Yeah, right, you hold Can it. Can you smell this? Hey, this is totally a stir, not a knife. <laughs> you hold it. No, 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 that was a stir. Oh, it was, it was a stir, okay. It really was a stir. So I, I got, I have an idea now. Uh, if we do a project similar to this, we should get people in the chat room or in the the know uh, the know how group mm -hmm. to take bets or not bets but we like totally we'll do be that. like okay Del Poco you know you guessed here and Bleak you guessed here and then see who who gets closer and then if you, you guess know. wrong uh, we kill you yeah well, well yeah, yeah mean, that's, that's the natural. stakes that's not, yeah. it's got to yeah. make it exciting if, if there's nothing on the line Brian it's not really exciting is <laughs> exactly. it exactly all right so again this soil is crazy super super dry it's the same stuff that we had last week. It smells earthy. It smells earthy. And actually, <laughs> when I when I opened it up this morning, there was like a layer of moss growing on it. Ew. Which is good. No, that, that means the soil's alive. We oh, like live okay. soil. Live soil Are there means nematodes in here, though? That there are, but because we're going to oxygenate this water, they're, they're not going to like it. Yes, yeah, see you in hell. So we <laughs> like this. We like this kind of fluffy soil that's alive because any sort of biological activity mm -hmm. uh, means that you're, you're actually generating the nutrients that you need. That makes sense. Yeah, it's not just dead soil. It's it's it, living soil. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take dirt. a little bit of this mm -hmm. and we're going to fill in these, these nasty craters that we've created. Well, don't put it on the plant. Well, <laughs> wait, is that bad? That's bad. <laughs> you want to kill no it. No wonder I'm so Why bad do at you this? want to kill it, Brian? <laughs> Does it please Are you, you trying to, to make it go back down below your line here? No. Yeah, you get that side. I'll get okay. this side. No, I'm just... <laughs> Dirt everywhere. So totally worth that it. mouse. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah, we're just leveling it Yeah, out. no, just level it out. Uh, and remember, it's going to settle a little bit, so it's okay to make it a little higher than you think it might need. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is these bean, bean sprouts and any other bean mm -hmm. are incredibly resilient. So there's yeah, after very our best little, efforts. Yeah, yeah, there's very little that you can do to actually kill them. In fact, in, in a future episode, we're going to start topping these. And what that will do is every time we top it, instead of one stalk, you're going to get two. Oh. So if you keep doing that, eventually you get one seedling that can cover this entire thing. That's cool. Yeah. And these will live for a while as long as we don't. These will, mess uh, it as up? long as we take care of them, they're not going to die. 
Okay. They will eventually, they will get pot bound, but uh, their roots are actually not that deep. Yeah. This is a, a five gallon bucket. Uh, so, and we've got six plants in here. This should be just fine. Yeah, you hear that little guys? You'll be just fine. Hang in there. Yeah. Uh, one thing is this plant, you'll notice it kind of, it didn't really adhere to the net except at the very top. Yeah. That's okay. Let it keep growing and eventually it will go in and out. Like this one, see this one only has one connection or two connections there. Mm -hmm. Eventually it will start going in and out and this will be a solid mat. Yeah. of beans and and if we should time lapse it we really should because I, I you know i've seen those videos where the plants grow and you can see you them kind of like yeah. they're like reaching out trying to find oh stuff. i mean if you'll see it if you just filmed one day of this and you have a uh, put a it's called a sun tracker it mimics the sun so that it moves back and forth oh you'll actually see them do this they, so they cool. reach for it uh, you guys are pretty smart somehow. I know. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe too smart. Kill yeah. the plants! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they know our secrets! Yeah, you start seeing vines trying to get into your house and stuff. All right, so we've got that down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put a layer of perlite over this so that's nice and we've evened out the surface. And again, this is not, this is, I don't prefer this because this perlite has been treated. Uh-huh. Uh, you don't, because it has, like a, yeah. you're saying it has nutrients it has in nutrients. fertilizer or something yeah. like that. Whoa. You want to get a little bit out on that on your side? Sure. And try to keep it off the plant. We, we're just trying to create a layer. Right. To, to keep the soil from to scouring. To the, the water when it hits it. Right. Precisely. That makes sense. All right. Oh. You should be good there. So I've got this side, you get that side. You can tell this stuff is pure. <laughs> when you pour it's, water over it. It's it uncut, blue. Brian. Yeah. I might need some more over Drug here. Drug humor. What? There you go. <laughs> I was thinking of like Naked Gun. <laughs> what is it, like uh, Comet? <laughs> they pour water over Comet. Yeah, it's the good stuff. It turns blue. There we go. All right, so what this is going to do is it, it's a protective layer so that when we water it, I mean, it's still going to move but at least it won't drill a hole into our... Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So this is the one that we've... Uh, this uh, was more or less pure. You seem unsure about that. I don't want to pour the one that was crazy salt. Yeah, that was the red one. See, if you notice, even though I'm pouring it in, it's not, like, destroying the surface. That's precisely what I want. And I just want to wet the soil down a little bit. Now there is there is something to say about allowing it to dry out a little bit. I like my automated watering system, mm -hmm. but I always leave the plants a little bit lacking because what I want to do is I want to promote root growth. And if you're providing all of the water and nutrients that the plant needs just within the initial root ball, mm -hmm. the the roots they're not encouraged to grow out. When it starts to dry out, they actually they, no, it's yeah. it's the same reason why the plant will follow a light source. If, if it's not getting the nutrients in the water it needs, the, the roots will actually kind of go out right. and, and search for it. So if you let it dry out a little bit, you can force the root system to become much stronger. Okay, so if you, if you don't give it too much water, it will eventually leave home, you know, <laughs> go out on its own, it's stop like, mooching I'm out. off of you. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Get a job. Can't even get a solid meal in this place. <laughs> But folks, this is our P project. We're going to be coming keep coming back to it every once in a while. Uh, but we're going to have to start looking at some of the other crops that we've been growing. Because as yeah. I mentioned, we've got plenty of herbs. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, squash growing now. I'm trying to grow melons that the first batch did not, not so good. Take. Uh, I was growing lavender. Yeah, it did not so good. Is, it la is remember, lavender hard to remember grow? Remember that mistake with my programming? Yes, yeah, that, that was the plant, the crop. That's the lavender. That was oh, gone. Oh, poor totally, little guys. Totally gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, next time we get to a Grow How episode, it's going to be a fun one because we need to start talking about your grow space. Hmm, sounds that a little dangerous. Is it going to need gloves for it's the grow space? It's definitely going to need gloves. Oh, man. Yeah. That's how you know it's going to be a good episode. Uh, we know that this was a lot of material, everything from how we take care of water to the links for the different devices that we use during the show. If you want to find out more about what we did on this episode of Grow How, you can go to our show notes, which, where do they find that, Brian? Oh, the usual place, twit.tv slash kh, and you'll find all the previous episodes that we've done, handy links, and Padre does a pretty good job of writing out all his notes I and do. stuff yeah, like that. that. So uh, definitely worth a look, and uh, if you haven't already, 
subscribe. Please do. Also, don't forget to follow us on our Know How group. That's mm -hmm. Google Plus. Just go to Google Plus, look for Know How. There is an approval process, but we get to you, we'll approve you immediately. It's just to stop the spam and the camera girls. You know how it is out you know on, the it is on the internet. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great place to post pictures and videos of your projects, to ask questions that can get answered by your experts, or if you're an expert, please come in and help the new people. Because remember, part of being a maker is helping other people to have the knowledge. That's right. Spread the knowledge. And uh, if you ever need to get a hold of us or see what we're doing outside of know-how, the place to do it is on Twitter. Twitter. I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And you can find our director, who is now a producer. That's right, producer Kara Cole. She makes sure that we call her that every time we address her. She's yes. almost too good I, for I'm this sorry, show producer now. Kara Cole, um, what, what is it that you do here at the Twit TV network now? Oh, you mean besides produce? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Um, well, originally I was an engineer, and then I became technical director. Well, I guess camera operator, too. So my business card is getting pretty crowded. What can I say? Wait, that, <laughs> happened, that happened all in eight months? Uh, yeah, you know. Hey, I Brian. mean, I graduated. College so how long how long did it take for you to become a producer? Uh, only like six years. Huh. Yeah, I think Brian became a producer what two months ago. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Well, yeah. that's okay. You do good. Mm. Right. She's yeah. moving up the ranks fast. I know. We may we may have to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? You hear that? Get to it, my young ones. <laughs> Get the coal. Get her, my pretty. She has manky candy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballisere. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you bro how. Oh, it's...